So last time we um, left off by deriving a pseudo derivation of the Schrodinger wave equation, um, and this is what we found. So you can review the last video um, to see how this was done. So if we simplify this equation a little bit more, <coughs> you can see that I can take the psi of x outside and then I have these two common factors left in the bracket. Then I see that this term is equal to e psi of x. Well, I can do this cool thing where I can take this whole quantity from here to here and I can replace it with some other symbol and I'm going to name that h hat. Um, it has a name which we'll see in a second. Um, and then I'm left with psi of x, uh, e of x, and psi of x right back out of the equation. Now this e, it corresponds to the total energy of the system. This h with the hat is actually called the Hamiltonian or the total energy operator. Essentially, it just defines or essentially it's just represented by the sum of the total energy of the system. We'll talk about that more in detail a little bit later. So as you can see, this equation and this equation only depends on time. So this is, sorry, only depends on distance or position x. So this is the time independent Schrodinger wave equation in its operator form in this case. However, there also exists a time dependent Schrodinger wave equation. So some systems evolve over time. Usually it's not so important um, in chemistry research, but it is also worth noting what this is because sometimes it is indeed very important. So this, the, the Schrodinger wave equation in its time dependent form looks something like this. And you can see that it, it involves a partial differential equation because it involves um, multivariables. It will derive the time dependent Schrodinger wave equation as we go along as well using the separation of uh, variables method. So now to the main thing. What do we mean by an operator? So generally an operator basically is a mathematical operation that acts on a function, any function, f of x, let's call it that, to produce a new function, and let's call that g of x. Um, and generally, we can write it in this form. So you have the operator, it acts on the function f of x, and you're producing a new function, g of x. Uh, so basically, like if you have a function x, and you square it, you get x squared, which is a new function. So you operated on the original function x by squaring it, and the operation was squaring it, and the g of x, or the new function, turned out to be x squared. So we're going to do something like that again. So we have to perform the following operations um, while also identifying what f of x is. So for the first one, the operator is equal to this whole thing. And f of x is clearly e to the exponent i h x. Okay. So uh, I can rewrite this equation as such. So I rewrite the operator as this. Okay. And then this operator will act on this function. So that means we'll first have to take the derivative of this function two times. We will have to multiply the function by 5 and then take its derivative one time. And then we'll have to take the derivative of the function zero times and then multiply whatever we get by the square root of 2. So the reason why I brought up this um, kind of silly, but it's too important, it's to highlight something that we'll be using later on. So 
if I take the derivative of e to the exponent i h um, x, sorry, I wrote k, it's actually x. I was doing simple harmonics before, so I'm rewriting the wrong things. Um, anyways, the, the first derivative of e to the exponent i h x, or i h bar x, is simply i h bar multiplied by 1 multiplied by e to the exponent i h x. But you have to take the derivative of that one more time. So you're left with i h bar squared and then e to the exponent i h bar x plus 5 times 1 derivative of e to the exponent i h x, which is just 5 times i h bar um, e to the exponent i h bar x. Now here, you're asked to take the derivative zero times. That's basically what it is. It's basically saying, you know, take the derivative of this zero times. So this is going to be a weird way of writing this right now, but it's to help out on an example um, where if this wasn't clarified, that might seem really hard. So if you take the zero derivative of something, basically you're taking the derivative of that thing zero times. Basically, you just get the same thing out. So you're left with square root of 2 multiplied by e to the exponent i h bar um, x. Now you can simplify this a little bit further, um, and I won't do that, but you can do that. So the next thing is, well, here I have not just f of x, I have f of x and y. And it's equal to x cubed multiplied by y to the, square, uh, y to the exponent 1 half. You're asked to perform this operation on it. You're supposed to take the partial derivative with respect to y um, of this function. So if that's the case, that means you're holding x constant while taking the derivative with respect to y. Um, this is how we usually do partial derivatives. So you're left with x cubed multiplied by 1 half multiplied by y to the exponent negative half, which is just the derivative of um, y to the exponent 1 half. So you can rewrite this as x cubed to the um, x cubed over 2y to the exponent 1 half. <coughs> now the last thing I want to highlight is here um, you have f of x is equal to a squared plus b cubed. Now the operation I'm asked to perform on this function is to square it. Well, if I square it, then I get this. I get a squared plus b squared plus 2ab. So a squared, in this case, would be a to the exponent 4, plus b squared would be b to the exponent uh, 6, plus 2a squared b cubed. OK, so this is the square operator. Now. It turns out that operators, when they act on functions, they can produce meaningless results as we just did. Um, they were, they're not, they don't have any physical meaning what we just did above. It was just to highlight a mathematical concept. But sometimes, when the properties of operators are known and understood, well, they can be used in certain ways on functions to yield meaningful information. So I'll tell you what that means in a second. In quantum mechanics, we will deal with only two classes of operators, linear and anti-linear operators only. Out of the few classes of operators, um, we'll only have to deal with two classes. And in, in fact, right now, we will only only deal with linear operators. Um, anti-linear operators are used in more abstract uh, calculations and, and theories. So what does it mean to be a linear operator or to be an anti-linear operator? Well, it turns out an operator is defined to be a linear operator if it meets true criteria. <clears throat> the first criteria um, is that when the, f when the operator acts on the sum of two functions, it acts on both functions as such. So it'll act on f of x, and it'll act on g of x.
<coughs> well, the second rule is also that when this operator acts on some constant multiplied by a function, essentially you can write the equation as the operator just acting on the equation um, and the operator, or sorry, the constant being pulled out. So um, we'll, we'll discuss this in an example, but these are all important concepts. So this is what makes a linear operator. If you meet these two criteria, you're a linear operator. So <clears throat> with that in mind, is this a linear operator? Well, we know the classification um, of what a linear operator is. If a linear operator is one, that if, if, if it acts on f of x plus another function, then <coughs> it should produce this result. OK. So if you put a constant c1 and c2 here, with this second rule in mind, I can rewrite this equation as this. So if you satisfy this condition, you are a linear operator. It just puts, it just puts these two together, and it rewrites it as one condition. OK, so let's see if this operator satisfies this condition. So I'm going to replace the operator by the nth derivative operator, which is basically just take the operator an n number of times. So if it acts on c1 f1x plus c2 f2x, well, we see that we indeed get this result. So therefore, taking the nth derivative, the first or the second or the third or the zeroth derivative of something, um, it does um, make it a linear operator, OK? So this is one example. The other is, is the square operator a linear operator? So we do it on the same criteria. In this case, I'm going to rewrite this a little bit shorthanded so that I can save time. So I'll get c1 squared f squared plus c2 squared g squared plus 2c1 c2 f times g, which is indeed not equal to c1 f squared plus c2 g squared. OK? So therefore, the square operator is not a linear operator. So the only other category of operators that is relevant in quantum mechanics is the anti-linear operators. I'm just going to briefly mention this because we don't even talk about this at all. It's just it's used more in abstract theories that deal with um, symmetry, for instance. Um, one major unanswered question in physics is, is, is there ultimate symmetry? There is p parity or parity based on position. Um, parity just means symmetry. So, so there is p parity. If you take a particle, you can orient it into space, and the laws of physics are min well maintained for that particle. However, the same is not always held for time because of entropy. Now, the entropy of the universe is always increasing. So if you go forward in time, you'll see that the entropy is increasing. Certain processes will happen in a certain way, which favors positive increases in entropy. If you rewind that, or you take negative t, if you take this transformation in the laws of physics, then you'll see that not every process happens the same way back and forth. So there's really, um, we're not, well, the scientists aren't really sure if there is T parity, if it's maintained or not. In fact, it's a really complex topic, so I won't talk about it too much. So anyways, the time reversal operators used in these theories regarding T parity, for instance, are anti-linear operators. And well, what makes an oper operator anti-linear? It's if an operator acts on a constant times a function plus another constant times another function, then essentially you get this result, OK, where this is the complex conjugate of the constant, and this is also the complex conjugate of the constant. So if this equation is maintained, then the operator is said to be antilinear. 